Welcome to the Mixology Talk Podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Julia. And we're the folks behind abarabove.com, the ultimate resource for craft bartenders, bar operators, and just about anybody else looking to make great craft drinks. I'm a bar consultant with more than 10 years of industry experience. And I run abarabove.com, bringing weekly articles and cocktail recipes to help you make great drinks and grow your career behind the bar. This is episode number 124 of the Mixology Talk podcast, uh, and we're going to be continuing on our trend talking about career development, uh, and this week we're going to be talking with David Sangwell from Bartender HQ. Now, many of you have probably either heard his podcast or seen his website, um, Bartender HQ, in the past, uh, but if you haven't, you definitely want to check it out. Um, he really knows what he's talking about. Uh, he's had a lot of experience in this industry, which he's going to be sharing with us today um, in a particular focus on multi-site operation, some things that we could really start to develop now in our bartending career, if that's where we see um, our future kind of heading as um, a professional, a bartender professional. So definitely want to check that out. Um, now, before we get started, I do have one little thing I need to share with everyone. Um, I was testing out some new software for recording, uh, recording remotely, and it just didn't work out. Um, luckily, since David also podcasts, he was able to send me his audio, um, but I had to kind of piece mine together based off of his. So if you notice some things are a bit off or a um, little bit of things, you know, audio glitches here and there, and there's definitely a good reason for that, and I apologize. I have figured that all that out, so hopefully in the future um, we will have to go through this again. So uh, definitely um, stay tuned, and I hope you enjoy. Hello, everyone from the United Kingdom, Her Majesty's very own. How are you? Good, man. Uh, it's been a while since we chatted. Yeah, I guess I guess so. I mean, I've spoken to um, Ju- Julia since then uh, when you were doing your uh, your online seminar. Um, uh, the yeah, so uh, so we had a a good chat then, and she joined us on our podcast, and I think we might be doing the same thing again. Yeah, those seminars were definitely a lot of fun. Uh, we had a lot of good turnout, and hopefully, people really enjoyed the information. Um, and that's one of the reasons why we asked you to come on to this podcast is uh, to kind of share your experience um, as a multi-site operator. Uh, our focus recently has been a lot on career development, and uh, you're somebody that's done a lot of different positions in this um, hospitality business, and uh, we're hoping that you can share some of your experience, some of your insights, and um, and wisdom uh, with all the, uh, the listeners of the podcast. Um, so would you mind just kind of describing kind of uh, your history, some of the places you've worked at, um, and uh, your robust experience uh, in the industry. I guess so. Yeah, I mean it's it's been pretty crazy. Uh, we'll we'll take it right from the beginning. So I started bartending in around about two thousand. Um, started off in a little nightclub in uh, in Stafford, where I was at university or uh, college for you guys. I'll translate into American. Um, yeah, so I was I was uh, at college uh, studying product design, engineering stuff, and uh, yeah, just ended up kind of falling into a position bar backing um, at this nightclub over here. Over here, we call it glass collecting. That's basically all you do. Um, but uh, yeah, so I kind of fell into that, and then uh, within about three weeks, I was actually bartending. Um, within about two or three months of that they decided to give me the bar downstairs which they would just renovated and turned it into a little cocktail bar um, now don't get too excited um, back in sort of 2000 2001 these cocktails were sex on the beach we, uh, woo-woos was a bit uh, pushing it forward for the uk because um, we didn't tend to have cranberry juice anywhere that's a very american thing um, so sex on the beach even over here had uh, a tendency of being grenadine orange juice Peach schnapps, vodka, mmm, the delights, the delights of the early 2000s. Um, so yeah, I kind of moved on from there. I decided uh, that university wasn't for me, um, as many of us do in this industry. We we tend to, so the focus uh, to abandon all the stuff we're meant to be doing and uh, get today, far too interested uh, in, in bars. Um, I started uh, teaching myself a little bit of flair back then. A um, guy called Scott Young, um, and some of the uh, skill sets that uh, you had a, a website, <laughs> which was uh, so super super exciting at the time, on, and uh, a VHS series. I know uh, that, that you've taught you how to play. Um, Scott Young's Extreme Bartending.com. 
Um, uh, and he's just launched a new project that uh, I've been a little bit involved with. So there'll be some stuff coming with that um, pretty soon. It's it's kind of an online education thing as well. Um, but yeah, I went through a, a bunch of different pubs, you know, general um, bartending, uh, British pubs, so looking after a lot of beers, uh, and then uh, did eight years with TGI Fridays um, from 2003 to uh, 2010, pretty much. Um, I did four bartender challenge finals during that time uh, at national levels. Um, so I, I really threw myself into it at that point and was uh, was really focusing on it. Uh, that's when I sort of really got into learning drinks and, and recipes and that sort of thing. And with Fridays over here, at least, there's about 700 drinks in their manual. Uh, and I, at one point, I, I could pretty much give my book to anyone and say, right, pick pick a name <laughs> and uh, I could recite them that was that was my party trick um which was useful when you're doing the competitions um 2010 I got a phone call uh, went out to um open a luxury hotel on the Palm in Dubai uh, so that was pretty cool nice nice year over there uh, worked on a lot of their training programs um there was there was an awesome guy over there um called Andrew Mullins from uh, Fling Bar Supplies uh, Fling Bar Services um now he's he's an absolute legend. I don't think I've actually spoken to him really since Dubai, but uh, good to give him a shout out because his his knowledge was invaluable. But at that resort, uh, I was looking after. By the time I left, looking after all four bars at the resort. So there was one that was a three Michelin starred chef, Yannick Galeno, um, from uh, Le Maurice in Paris. Uh, he was kind of overseeing the whole resort, but he had like a signature venue and. Uh, yeah, every, every bar had a different concept, and we were doing molecular mixology stuff um, at uh, 101, which was the one that I got to play with. So we were doing uh, mainly foams, so we were using uh, the El Bulli texturers, so uh, xanthan gum and uh, methyl cellulose, that kind of thing, to stabilize these uh, foams. So that was really fun. Uh, ended up coming back to the UK, and I, I kind of felt a bit burnt out on bars at that point. Um, so, uh, I came back to the UK for like three days and shot out to one of the, uh, the awful resorts in Europe called Kavos, um, and spent three weeks over there just, uh, bartending in awful bars. Um, <laughs> it was, it was really fun though. Um, just a lot of drinking involved. Uh, and then when I came back, to, when I came back to the UK after that, I, uh, as I say, I was, I was looking to probably move out of the, the bar industry a little bit. Um, sorry, apologies for the rabbit noise. The rabbit's having a little drink uh, next to me. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I, I ended up working a little bit in web design, um, dabbled a little bit in close-up magic and stuff like that, um, and then eventually uh, met a girl um, in, in Birmingham while I was performing magic who ran a nightclub. Um, Birmingham is where I've been based before I went out to Dubai. I uh, ended up moving back up here, took a management role with um, Frankie and Benny's, which is a, a American, um, New York Italian kind of uh, venues over here, casual dining. Um, so did that for a little while. Um, didn't love it, so moved on to back into nightclubs and back into bits and bobs like that. And uh, eventually, the nightclub that my uh, this lady that I'd uh, <laughs> that I'd met. Um, was running, was closed down. Uh, it ran out of lease, and they decided not to renew it. So uh, she was made redundant. I uh, was moved on to one of their other clubs. Um, this lady that I met at the time is also uh, upstairs right now uh, with my kids because that's my wife. Um, <laughs> that's my wife, Joe. Um, so yeah, it, <laughs> there was certainly some good came out of uh, working in the clubs for a little while. Um, but, uh, yeah, they messed me around a little bit in terms of salaries and things, and I saw an advert for a bar called the Jekyll and Hyde that was looking for a general manager. So I applied for this bar. It was one that I was aware of before, and the Jekyll and Hyde's a, a gin parlour. In the UK, especially at the moment, gin is the thing. Um, where I know bourbon's huge out there in the States, uh, gin is probably uh, what bourbon is to you guys. Um, so it's it's absolutely enormous. There's craft distilleries all over the place, and um, yeah. So I applied for this Jekyll and Hyde. Didn't get the role, um, but it was part of a, uh, a small group of bars uh, called Bitters and Twisted, and this is where we get into multiple operators. So um, 
they didn't want to offer me the Jekyll and Hyde role, but they gave me a role um, as a drinks development manager for the group. So I essentially had ten, uh, ten different bars with uh, eight different concepts that I was looking after um, for uh, for about a year, uh, writing menus, dealing with drinks reps, and uh, and all that side of things. All the stuff that you would be doing for one bar uh, as a bar manager, other than physically being behind the bar on a day to day basis. Um, was what I was uh, taking care of. So, shall we start there? There is, yeah. Like I said, man, you've done pretty much everything there is to do in the bartending career. Yeah, actually, there's a, there's a couple of other bits that that we did along the way while we were working at the nightclub. Um, because we were trying to cost cut, I was also the cleaner. Um, so I would be there on a, a Sunday morning, um, mopping the entire club, uh, cleaning the bathrooms, the works. So. Yeah, I've I've filled in that role. I've been a um, I've been an announcer, I guess, not quite a DJ, but uh, a compare for flair competitions at the club and that sort of thing as well. So yeah, I've I've been <laughs> around a lot of the industry and obviously running bartender HQ as well. Um, so so kind of commentating on the industry as well as being directly involved with it. Yeah, like I said, man, you've done pretty much everything there is to do. Um, that's pretty crazy. Um, now, I'm hoping that uh, you can kind of shed some light on how you made that jump from bartender to multi-site operator, because I imagine that's a pretty big leap. Um, I know you mentioned that you started, um, you know, tending bar and going through those steps and then running a beverage program for 10 different places. But I'm hoping you can tell us about kind of that, that progression that you went through. Yeah, so so I guess the, the best way to explain it is um, I, I kind of applied for this uh, general manager role. Um, it's it's quite a, quite a substantial venue, it's two, over two floors, uh, and they didn't think they had enough experience with the management side of things, which I agreed I didn't. Um, but this role kind of fit everything else that I'd done. So it was the training side of things that I'd done while I was in Dubai. Um, it was uh, putting the concepts together. It was... Um, I also worked at one stage for a uh, for a magic shop. As I say, I, I had dabbled in the magic world a little bit. Um, and while I was working for World Magic Shop, who are based out here in the UK, um, I was dealing with wholesalers and I was dealing with um, shipping out to um, our suppliers around the world because we created products and then sold them to other wholesalers. But I was also buying in the products from the other wholesalers to sell to our customers. So it was kind of um. So I'd kind of worked with multiple um, sources, I guess. Uh, so we we'd be setting up deals with those guys. And so because I've got this kind of sales background, I've got a little bit of a little bit of just kind of broader world experience. Um, and and obviously I I been involved in competitions i'd done a bit of menu development for tgi fridays in the uk while i was there um purely because i happened to know the person that had moved into it because she used to work as a manager in one of our stores um so it was all those little things that kind of pile up and this is kind of one of the things that i think is really important is not to be 100 percent exclusive when when you're looking at moving beyond uh, being a bar manager or you know the the general kind of steps up that you go there's other things that you will be doing outside of the bar industry directly that will be skills that you can transfer in in the same way that the skills that we learn as bartenders and and as as bar managers can transfer out um there's a lot of stuff that you can bring in from from your everyday life whether it's you know, whether it's a sports team that you're a part of and you could be, I don't know, working on rosters for a, for a sports team and then bring that into a management role where you're working with a, a team of people and you need to make sure that everyone's available on the right times, that sort of thing. All of these kinds of things can actually be really, really useful. And I, I, I think um, not restricting yourself purely to the bar industry can be really helpful in these things. Yeah, I would absolutely agree with that statement. And there's so many things to learn as it applies to just general business that there's really no limit to how much progress um, you could make it if you really applied yourself to. I know, um, you know, the new bar roles uh, that are out there, I think, um, you know, understanding and being fluent in social media, whether it be Facebook or Twitter or Instagram, uh, I mean, they each have their own kind of language and algorithm behind them. Um, that can absolutely apply, be applied, photography, filmmaking, any of these things could definitely be utilized in um, 
Absolutely, mm. absolutely. Yeah, so it was it was really fun. The, the bars that we were looking at, after, so uh, the first one that they opened opened just over 10 years yeah. ago. So the group's been around for a little while. It's not um, sort of a flash in the pan. Uh, they opened Island Bar, which is a tiki-style venue. Um, it, was, it was always a flair venue when I was younger, and it was the, the cool place for the bar to go. Uh, nowadays, it's more about, you know, um, blow torches and, and tiki drinks that are on fire and... Uh, stuff that comes in medicine bottles as if it's a, a, a shot from The Simpsons, I think, uh, was the concept with that one. And uh, they, they, they'd made up the labels for it and everything. It was so, it was really, it's a really fun, like, laid back venue. They do a geeky quiz on a Sunday night. They've got retro retro consoles for people to play on. Um, so it's, it's a really fun kind of venue. Then they opened uh, a, a, a traditional kind of pub um, called the Victoria. Uh, which is literally just around the corner from Island Bar, tended to be like a feeder venue for it. So um, uh, the Vic did uh, did regular food. They do the the old, really traditional hand pump uh, beers that you get in the UK and nowhere else in the world, uh, I think. Uh, so yeah, cask conditioned. So it's kind of still live beer in these ca- uh, casks that come out. Um, you have to leave them. You have to rack them up, settle them for a for a, a day or so before you can do anything with it, because otherwise you're going to get hops and stuff in your glass, and it's not so good. Um, then uh, yeah, I mean that. So that place became our sort of whiskey specialist. So um, Scotch um, kind of world whiskies. We ended up with a another venue called Buffalo and Rye, which is our American whiskey specialist and smokehouse. Um, we had a place uh, called Bodega, which we've actually... Uh, w- I, I keep saying we, I'm not there anymore. Um, but uh, B- Bodega is our um, South American concept. There's four of those now. Um, and that's obviously your uh, your tequilas, piscos, cachaça, mezcal. Um, so that, that kept us quite busy with that one and, and all the food that went with it. So that's kind of a food-led place. Um we had the Jekyll and Hyde, as I mentioned, which is our gin parlour. Uh, the Rose Villa Tavern, which is this beautiful stained glass windows pub um, in the jewellery quarter of Birmingham. And that's uh, that was our vodka specialist, 140-something vodkas in there. Um, and then, yeah, Marmalade at the Rep Theatre, um, which is a, a 1,500 capacity theatre in, in the city centre of Birmingham. Um, yeah, and so we we ran the bistro, which is the the sort of cafe at the front of it, which is obviously everyone eating before the before the shows. Uh, that was a sort of ninety cover restaurant, I believe. And then, as well as doing the main bars during the intervals and pre show, post show, so uh, you go from like fine dining to ridiculously high volume for fifteen minutes, and then back. <laughs> so we we did a lot of pre batched cocktails there. Um, uh, but that was a vermouth specialist venue. That was our kind of unique uh, selling point there. So I think we had about sixty vermouths um, and amari and that kind of thing. So that was that was quite nice, uh, quite fun to play with as well. Um, and then the new inn was our final one, which didn't actually have like a spirit specialism, but it was kind of a traditional gastro pub kind of style. Um, so yeah, it was a, a, a quite an eclectic group of bars to look at. Yeah, that must have been a lot of fun, and you must have learned so much with uh, being exposed to so many different kind of specialty um, style of bars and restaurants. Um, that's pretty crazy, uh, especially with the uh, the high volume uh, fine dining place that you mentioned. Uh, that must have been a, a nice challenge um, to run that very smoothly. Now, with so many different diverse concepts as uh, as you guys had in your portfolio, um, and so many places all over town. Uh, what are some of the systems that you developed that help kind of keep this engine running smooth? So so the fun part was I had to kind of develop the training materials for everyone else. Um, but because I'd already, like, I didn't come into this uh, this group of venues cold, you know, they, they'd already got this established kind of concept in place. So each of the venues had got the person that you went to to check. Uh, and so you kind of you have to recruit those people and be like, right, you're my kind of bar champion here. Um, you know, you advise me on what we should be bringing in. We'll taste them together and then we'll make the decisions. And and it worked the same way with the menus. Like if I was to go into these venues and just 
write a menu, give it to the guys, and go, right, here's your new menu, um, you're going to get a lot of pushback. Um, whereas if you go into into the venues and go, right, what, what, what works, what doesn't work, you know, you, you get into a lot of the data, and I know that's one of your specialties, is, is looking at the data. So when, when we're looking at redeveloping one of these uh, menus, first thing you decide is, right, do I want more cocktails on the list, less cocktails on the list? Um, each of these venues would probably have 30 to 40 um, cocktails on the menu. Um, Holy cow. Yeah, yeah. Um, however, you've got to kind of understand there is a slight difference between the way that it works in the UK and the US. If you go into a bar in the UK, um, if the drink isn't on the menu, people assume you can't get it. So, like, people aren't going into a bar going, you know what, can I just get a daiquiri? It doesn't happen if it's not on the menu. Uh, because because bartending in the UK, there's such a kind of dichotomy. You've got uh, the super professional bartenders. Obviously, we've got some incredible bartenders over here. But the vast majority of people behind a bar are just there to make a bit of extra cash. They don't put any work in. Um, you're not expected to know cocktails before you go into a bar. Um, you know, uh, the only things that we do have is... Um, I, I think we've touched on in the past is the differences in licensing in the UK and the US and um, with the personal licenses and uh, like we have to have a license holder on the premises and they kind of authorise everyone else to sell um, alcohol on their, on, on their behalf um, whereas over there I know there's a lot more personal accountability having said that over here if you serve someone underage or, or what have you um, you do get fined personally but it's I don't think the consequences are quite what they are in the US um, in terms of if, if someone gets drunk and then goes and drives home and crashes through a housing estate um, so I, I think I think there's there's a difference there and I think that makes a difference um, over here though it's like super um, super unacceptable to drink and drive it's like just really it's it's such a social thing um, that people just don't do it very very often obviously there's some um, but it's not it's not a, a huge deal like it was maybe 10 years ago. I mean, well, that's definitely a, a good thing for sure. Um, now, with managing so many different bars, uh, were there any tools that you used to help kind of leverage your time and keep, and keep each location organized? Um, I mean, since obviously you can't kind of be everywhere at once, uh, what were some of the things that you utilized um, to kind of keep moving forward? Yeah, so things like um, e even something as simple as inventory. Um, obviously I'm not going to be the one that goes around to every venue and counts all the stock and puts everything into the system so we, we had got a, uh, a point of sale system that worked well um, and all of the venues would use the same point of sale system however we didn't have them linked because everyone had their own um, their own menus it was all completely uh, independent from that point of view they just happened to use the same system so uh, everyone would generate the same reports, and then uh, we use Dropbox actually as our as our kind of hub. So uh, we we had the Dropbox for Teams, so we've got like a terabyte of storage, uh, and everyone had their own kind of area within Dropbox. They drop all their reports in there. I'd just go into their folders, grab the reports that I needed, um, populate a spreadsheet, um, which was all set up. Uh, so um, if they were within the 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 bounds that we'd uh, given the tolerances then it highlight in green if they were within the next band it would be yellow if they were outside of it it'd be red so it was nice and easy to do at a glance to sort of see uh, once a month uh, and then I'd kind of report to the operations managers and the owner um, where all the bars were and what actions we were taking if if they were needed so it sounds like you were um, kind of reconciling inventory looking at the numbers. Um, if any action that needs to kind of happen, um, you can reach out to vendors, potentially talk about better pricing, um, different product placements, or other kinds of support to kind of help um, help your beverage program, essentially. Yeah, so that's definitely a, an aspect over here. Um, I think it's even probably more in-depth over here. Uh, we have... Um, uh, so, obviously, we've got the big boys, like we've got... Um, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, Bacardi, people like that that are uh, based over here and they have the same kind of portfolio as they do over in the US. Uh, then you've got kind of slightly smaller players um, like William Grant and Sons, which are obviously still big with Monkey Shoulder and um, Hendrix and exactly that kind of thing. Um, so they're a little bit smaller, but they, they've still got some, some real clout. They've got things like um, 
uh, Russian Standard over here. I'm not sure if they do in, in the States as well. Um, but that's it's one of these great vodkas for its price. Um, the other one that I always think is really good for the price is um, Sky. Sky is just super good for the money. Um, and uh, I always used to upset my Russian friends by serving them that. Um, when I was in Dubai, it was very fun. Um, but yeah, I mean, we cer we certainly had that. And then you you've got you've got the distributors, which are the, those guys, and then you've got separately from that the wholesalers. So they're the guys that actually deliver to you. Um, and I uh, my current role, I I work with probably the largest in the UK. Uh, which is a, a company called Matthew Clark. They probably serve about 30-35% of the on-trade. Um, so, but obviously we're a smaller country. So, um, But yeah, we're, it's part of the larger group that I work for. Um, but then you've got a lot of smaller wholesalers that are kind of local or they're kind of cash and carry style, you know, like a Costco style or that kind of thing. Um but yeah, it, at that point, you've kind of you you've got to find someone that stocks everything that you want, or will take on the products that you're looking for. Uh, and obviously, we were using such um, esoteric kind of products um, because we had all of these different specialties um, that we had to find someone that was really willing to take on random stuff on a whim for us. Like, uh, for example, there was a, a a peach sort of wine vermouth. Uh, called uh, Rankin Can Pesh that we that we wanted to use in a few of the venues, um, and it's a really kind of obscure thing. Uh, it's made by Distilleries Domaine de Provence. Um, little shout out for those guys because this stuff is amazing. Uh, and if you haven't found it over there, you should definitely look for it. It's like biting into an actual peach. It's all flavoured with peach peach leaves. Um, so it's it's really interesting stuff. Um, but yeah, we had to find wholesalers that would kind of just pick these things up on a whim for us um but yeah absolutely um in terms of negotiation and stuff yeah um we tended to have uh we've got what we call retros over here so um you'll have a, a retrospective discount on stuff so if you hit volume targets um then you'll get a, a pound back a bottle uh, when you hit this target you'll get 150 a bottle back when you hit the next target if that makes sense um, and, and you'll kind of set those expectations at the beginning of a contract and, and, and then, you know, three months in you'll review it, make sure that you're on track. Um, so that's the sort of thing that you can do. And absolutely, if you're taking multiple lines from a certain um, distributor, so say if you were going to take your speed rail and you were going to put Smirnoff and Captain Morgan's and Gordon's in there or something like that, then you would certainly get uh, probably more favourable um, terms from those guys in terms of the uh, the retrospectives um in general then you would negotiate your actual price like you don't negotiate your price with the distributor you negotiate that with the wholesaler and then your um your retros are kind of like an over the top that comes directly from the distributor so that bypasses the wholesaler yeah 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 so so that's kind of how it works and and some of that can be in stock some of it can be in in cash um, this is this is the dark side of the industry, but so yeah, this is the kind of stuff that you kind of you never understand until you get into that kind of role. Yeah, I think the the word that I like to use for this is um, vendor support, um, and this comes in many different ways. I think we've talked about this in the past, um, but it can come in the way of product placement, um, printing menus, uh, staff training. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a financially you know direct financial benefit. To the bar or restaurant it could be a, a very indirect uh, method as well um, but yeah to your point it definitely happens um, but I think this is also another benefit of you know having a relationship with your vendors because um, they can outline some of the things that they have the power to help you with um, and I think that's one of the really big things um, that many restaurants could do a little bit better at for sure yeah, absolutely, and the relationship thing is is really key to me. Though I, I wrote an article a while ago that was um, like the biggest mistake that bars make, and that's where the you've got the bar owner that's sitting at home like checking the prices of every wholesaler and cash and carry every yeah, sitting there sitting there. Oh, like I can save twenty five p a bottle if I go to this guy this week because they've got an offer on. Like if you've got a good relationship with your brand reps, you're going to get so much more value than. Uh, the the twenty five p a bottle that you know maybe if you're a busy venue that's gonna add up to 
I don't know, 35 bucks a week. But you spent two hours on that. <laughs> on that 35 bucks and if you can't bring more than 35 bucks worth of business in in a couple of hours you're in the wrong place i was like no i need to get my smirnoff from from this guy down the street and i'll, I'll go and pick it up because then i'm gonna pay the three bucks delivery charge or whatever and you just spend your whole day like chasing around after like 30 30 cents or something uh, like i don't i don't get it but but they're like well look look at all the money i've saved you know <laughs> And you're like you spent you spent a whole day saving thirty thirty dollars. Like, what are you thinking? Um, so yeah, I mean that's that's one of the things. But I I do think like having like when you can find a rep that you really get on with as well, um, give them some business because they will they will look after you. You'll probably get the odd bottle. You know when they just happen to be passing, you're gonna get a a, a bottle dropped off to you. Like, a, oh, try this. You know, and yeah, that's. 20 bucks or whatever yeah i totally agree i think that one of the things that um, a lot of buyers don't understand is how many different um programs a lot of these um, salespeople have access to that never even come up in conversation um, unless you have a really good relationship with them and open up and say hey look this is what i'm trying to do with this business so you know i want to get to here um, you know, these are the products I'm looking for and have an open line of communication. Uh, if, if you just have a very adversarial communication uh, style with a lot of reps, which is fairly normal, um, then you're not going to get this kind of treatment. You're not going to have a long standing relationship. Uh, you're not going to really understand all the benefits that come from having a great relationship with your providers. Now imagine running a multi-unit uh, restaurant and bar team has got to have a lot of complications with it. Um, there are a lot of processes you can put in place, um, but at the end of the day, the, this is a lot of people to manage. Um, what are some of the um, challenges that you had in this position? One, one of the things that was, uh, that was really tricky was in terms of training and stuff, uh, trying to get uh, the bartenders there. As I mentioned earlier, like in, in the UK at least, um, a lot of bartenders are also students and that kind of thing, so they're not generally uh, around during the daytimes. So that means you've got to try and do your trainings in the evenings, which is also when your bar's busy. So that makes it really tricky. Um, so we we tried uh, to do a few of these training sessions where we'd do a daytime one and an evening session so that people could come to either. And even that was proving tricky, so I just started doing them electronically. So I just I started start creating video content that we could use for training so even things like um like alcohol awareness uh, and not over serving uh, i created a short video using some resources i found online um and then we used survey monkey to uh, to create a quiz at the end um so i'd got a like a a piece of paper that i could go well you you've done it you've done it you've done it you've not done it get out <laughs> do you know what i mean um but yeah, absolutely. And you just emailed a link out to everyone. We we also started trying to use Slack um, to to communicate between all of the teams so that we could actually have um, bartenders from different bars be able to pick up shifts. Um, so they could do shift swaps um, through Slack. Uh, it was it was tricky. The difficult thing with that was getting people to actually sign up for it and then check it. Um, to be completely honest, and you're only allowed to do so many invitations, which was about half the company, and then because not everyone was on it, other people, were, oh, it was hard work. Um, but yeah, that that would be a really useful thing that you could use, especially within a single bar team. Um, if if people need to be able to message each other, they don't necessarily all want to have each other's phone numbers. Um, sometimes that could be easier, or WhatsApp even would work. Yeah, I recently went to a uh, seminar at Tales of the Cocktail um, in 2017, and um, they focused on this one particular bar, uh, and they did kind of a deep dive on the construction and all this stuff, um, and even went into how they're operating now. And one of the things that was brought up is the use of technology in there, um, and Slack was actually mentioned, and the way they used it, um, very much in a similar way to what you're using it for, is to manage a team, have a bunch of different conversations. Um, but the thing that I really liked about it was it creates a very clear distinction between work and personal. Um, so, for example, you use Slack to chat about, uh, to chat about work where uh, somebody's text message is very sacred um, and their phone number is sacred, so you only communicate them with them uh, through that channel in a very personal way. So instead of, hey, you want to pick up my shift on Tuesday, it's like, hey, man, I got the day off. You want to go grab a burger and uh, watch a game? So it keeps that um, 
your phone uh, sacred and keeps it personal. So that, that that was a really cool thing that I saw from that um, seminar. Yeah, absolutely. So a lot of a lot of our bars were using Facebook to um, to distribute uh, schedules and that kind of thing. And I was like, well, let's not have it all on Facebook because that just does just feel like your home stuff. And then we've got a few people that are like, oh, I'm not going on Facebook. It's like, okay, we'll just do this for work, and then that's that's all you need to do. Um, so that was quite handy. The other thing I think that was the the key skill. Um, obviously, communication is is the biggest one, but being able to kind of um, build relationships really quickly with teams. Um, if you can memorize people's names, that really helps. Um, so in the same way that you would with people's drinks, um, make a real effort to, to remember people's names in the bars. So when you walk in, they're like, they know you and you, you can actually greet them by name. That's a really key thing. Now I've come across a couple of tips on memorizing names, but do you have any tips of your own, uh, for how to instantly remember someone's name? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, the one that I always used to use, and this came way back in the day from like a pickup artist book, um, but it works. Um, so essentially you, you kind of create a really vivid picture in your head of that person standing next to a celebrity or someone else that already has that name, uh, like with their arm around them and in, in a stupid pose so that it's really memorable image. Um, so if I met, uh, if I met you, then I'd probably, uh, get an image in my head of you next to Chris Hemsworth or, you know, Thor. Uh, but in his full costume, or you in the Thor costume, in your head, a- absolutely, absolutely. Um, but yeah, th- something like that works really quite well. If it's if it's a name that you know straight away when you see it, like a George, George Clooney, you know, there's there's all of these names out there. It, when you get someone with a really crazy name as well, it tends to be quite easy to remember, um, and and you don't have to worry about finding a celebrity with that name too. Um, so that's that, that's what I've always used, and and you can also, if uh, if you want to do their drinks, you can actually have them holding the drink that they would drink, um, and if you can do it in branded glassware in your head as well, even better, because then you then you're really on it. Man, that's a really good tip. I like uh, how you're kind of weaving all these little tiny elements in, and it kind of adds up to this whole mental picture about who this person is. I, I'm definitely going to have to remember that. Um, now I know some of the ones I've heard in the past have been, you know, say their name a couple of times. Um, you know, in a, in a small amount of time, but uh, I know that can get kind of irritating. Um, so I try not to do that one too often. Um, so now let's talk about some of the skill sets that you need to develop um, as you move from managing a single team versus managing uh, multiple teams. So if someone was looking to make that jump, what are some of those skill sets uh, that they can be actively working on um, that will help them uh, when they start to manage multiple sites? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think one of the one of the most important things is it's it's being organised enough uh, more than communication even. So things like where where you go to a meeting and you agree something with someone, drop them an email afterwards and just confirm what you've agreed, uh, because then you can kind of look back on it and you can say, look, this is what we've agreed, um, and and just ask them in the email to just confirm that that's their understanding too. Um, that can be really useful. Um, because there's so much stuff going on between ten different bars that trying to trying to keep up with everything does take a lot of effort, a lot of effort. Um, so that's that's certainly one of the biggest tips I would say. Um, if you're trying to get stuff to happen uh, with, for example, if I was trying to get a GM to uh, to get something done that I've kept asking for, like we we've put uh, one of the things that we did immediately was. Um, to use a uniformed uh, color code uh, system across the store and pour bottles across all the bars uh, because uh, when I walked in everyone was using their own codes per bar and then they'd borrow staff from another bar and that staff member would be pouring um, tomato juice instead of cranberry into into a woo-woo and it's not as good um, it's weird yeah so so that was the first thing that I did was, well, pretty much within my first month, we, we standardized the, the store and pour um, color codes and everyone hated me for it, but I didn't care because I was going in and out of the different bars and I didn't want to fuck up. <laughs> yeah, you don't want to be the beverage director walking in there and making, you know, a Cosmo with 
um, tomato juice or something equally silly and then having all the bartenders saying, this guy doesn't even know what he's talking about. Um, so making the uniform storm pours just definitely makes a lot of sense, especially if you're going to have a lot of bartenders um, crossing over from different properties. Um, it's, it's, yeah, I would imagine that would be very frustrating, and um, I'm sure a lot of people would be very much on board with that. Now, having to work with many different personalities and leadership styles for a bunch of different properties. Um, how did you motivate and get everyone on board uh, with the direction that you were kind of taking them? So it was an interesting one because I wasn't essentially like the, the venues didn't come under me. I was kind of on a par with them. It was more of an advisory role for a lot of them. Um, so because we had a mixture of general managers that some of them were bar oriented and others were far more kind of restaurant oriented. Uh, the restaurant oriented ones I took much more of a leadership role with, and with the the venues that were more um, where the GMs had more of a bartending background, uh, it it tended to be more of an advisory role. So I think uh, the number one thing is being able to read the situation and know what's required from you. Um, so that that was my first thing. Like my first month, I didn't aim to make any changes to anything. Um, and it's purely a case of go in there, like get feedback. Where are they having problems? Where are they struggling? Um, and and when I went into the bodega bar, the first thing they were like was, "Well, here's the new menu that we're rolling out in two days. Uh, we didn't write it, and it was the guy that was doing your job before you that wrote it, and nobody knows how to make them, and we haven't tried them yet." And I was like, "Okay, cool." So, so the printing's done. Yes, the printing's done. Excellent stuff. Good. Um, right. So, so yeah. So, so we we went we we went and made them, and we were like, mm. so forty five percent of these have passion fruit in, right? Okay, cool. Um, and then the others all have chili in. Excellent. So it was a really interesting menu. It was it was like it had obviously been kind of thrown together at the last minute. Because the guy was like, oh, I'm out of here anyway. <laughs> so, yeah. Who doesn't love passion fruit? So, um, yeah, so it was a, a bit crazy. We we launched the menu and then we changed it about three months later. Um, but it was a case of like, right, let's see what actually works on this, what's terrible, uh, and get rid of it. But yeah, it, absolutely. There's, uh, from from the leadership point of view, sorry, I keep going off on tangents. Um yeah, it's it's very much a case of uh, lead by example, especially with the bartenders themselves, because um, the, the fact that, well, whenever I went and introduced myself uh, and we did a, a first team meeting, the first thing I would do is go around the room and go, right, where have you worked before? You know, uh, tell me a little bit about your background. Um, where have you worked before? Is it your first bartending gig? All that kind of stuff, just to get a kind of read of the room, because you, that's the first thing you need to do. And then when it got round to me, I would give them my history that we did at the start of the show. And they'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, this guy actually knows what he's doing. Um, kind of. <laughs> he looks like he knows what he's doing. Enough. Yeah, I imagine that actually goes a long way to kind of help build your credibility. Um, the fact that you have so much history and so much experience in this business. Um, and them knowing that, okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. I'm sure that's really uh, beneficial in a position like this. Absolutely, and certainly taking taking their ideas when we were looking to refresh menus and that sort of thing made a massive difference. Um, like the Victoria, for example, had got, I think, 22 drinks on their menu when I went in, and four, four or five of them actually sold. Like more than 10 a week um so when we revamped their menu we took it to 18 drinks so we reduced it down no cocktail had more than four ingredients and the week after we launched it we had 187 percent uptake on cocktails like um 187 percent growth on cocktails and there was one cocktail that sold less than 30 i think so like it just it spread it out. They sold a lot more cocktails because they were faster to make. Um, yeah, so 
that that's the kind of that's what we were doing <laughs> yeah like allowing bartenders to contribute uh to the cocktail menu is such an easy way to get buy-in from the staff and really does go a long way to help kind of build that team atmosphere that i'm, I'm sure is really important uh when you're running multi-site uh, operation like this um the other thing is it just really goes a long way to probably boost cocktail sales in general you know you have a bartender working and, and somebody asks for a recommendation and you're like oh i came up with this cocktail i think you're really going to like it um you know and they'll be able to describe it because they came up with a drink um, and i imagine that can really help to amplify um uh, cocktail sales just in general um so now if you're new to bartending and you have an idea that you want to you know be a multi-site operator you kind of want to take those steps um, in order to kind of progress your career in that general direction, uh, what recommendations would you have for people? So absolutely, um, to begin with, it's exactly what you were talking about last week, is uh, try and get a bit more responsibility within the bar that you're in, whether that's uh, paid or whether it's a case of just getting the experience. So help your current bar manager to do the stock take, you know, to do the inventory um, on a weekly basis. Ask how it's input into the system find out how to do um, payroll, uh, you know, so everything that you can find out, do it. Um, spend time at home, um, in your free time, educating yourself about categories. There's so much information on the internet now with websites like your own, uh, with with the um, mixology course that you do, with the, the balancing drinks and everything like that. It's it's a huge resource, and all of this stuff is out there. It's just it's there to be taken, but you've got to take it. You've got to grab it. Um, so, like when I first started, as I say, I was I was working from flare videos on VHS tapes that I had to order, um, and this was like 2000. So the internet was not what it is today. YouTube didn't exist for a few years after this. Um, you know, I was looking at little postage stamp size uh, trailers. It, it's never been easier to become a good bartender um and this is the joy of it as well is that you're not having to start from scratch you're not having to start from um working out what works together it's all out there you know you can even watch tipsy bartender there's stuff on tipsy bartender that you will find and you'll be like that's actually quite good yeah, I got to say, um, you know, he gets a lot of flack for making a little bit more consumer facing uh, cocktail videos, but he's actually pretty good. He's super entertaining. He's a lot, a lot of fun to watch. Um, and every once in a while, he'll have a really great insight into some things that we can implement in our bar programs as well. Um, he's definitely a different style for sure. But there's, you know, things like, um, I, I'm trying to remember what the name of it is, uh, but it's basically the glitter that you can put into um, shooter bottles. Uh, and then you spin it round, and the whole thing just uh, it's um ah why don't I know the name but you I, I think you know what I mean this it's like dazzle dust or something like that it's um but it's it's really good stuff and it's used in cakes and that sort of thing so it is edible um but yeah this is this is all you need to do is like look look for it it's there. Uh, there's some there's brilliant stuff out there on like craft working flair. There's brilliant stuff out there on balancing drinks. There's brilliant stuff out there, and a lot of it you don't have to pay anything for. Um, if you want to get really in depth, things like your course just makes sense because you do have to put a lot of work in to make something like that. But but there's so much like basic stuff, and the brands are putting stuff out. Talk to your local reps if you if you're working in the bars. Um, talk to your reps. Get them to come and do tastings for you. They will do it. It won't cost you a penny. You'll educate yourselves more, um, and and you'll also start to build up these relationships with the reps as well, which is a really important thing. If you go to any tastings that are happening in your city, uh, meet the reps, go and shake hands, say thanks very much, really appreciate it. I work at such and such a bar. Um, you know they're going to remember you guys, and and uh, that's a huge huge hurdle that you're already through i know this is something that we harp on a lot um, on our podcast but having good relationship with your vendors is really really important for the long term uh benefit if you're going to be in this industry uh, for a long time it really does go a long long ways um now what about some of the jump from let's say bar manager to general manager uh, what are some of those skill sets that you need um, yeah you should probably start developing now so basically as you go as you go that way it's more um, moving away from probably you're going to spend a lot of time in front of spreadsheets and stuff like that but that should be kind of second nature you need to make sure that the money coming in is bigger than the money going out that's the 
that's the basics um but it's all it's just this thing that i've come up with um but uh, but i do think it's more about um eq when you're in a gm role because i think you're you're not managing the individuals behind the bar you're managing your team of managers to manage the people behind the bar so you've got to kind of understand at a higher level kind of what's going on you need to make sure that all the bills are paid you need to push people in the right direction so you're kind of having an overview of the venue i think the most important thing as a manager is to actually walk outside your front doors and um and walk in from your guest perspective and like you know if there's a pile of uh, cigarette butts on the ground outside go and pick up a dustpan and brush like but be seen to do those things yourself and not just walk through the door and go guys can you go and sort out the uh, the trash outside you know what i mean um i think i think that that kind of leading by example is important i don't think it's everything you will you also need to be having more of an overview of the venue and making sure that those things if you've seen it and you've fixed it yourself you need to put something in place to make sure that you don't have to fix it again like add it to a checklist you know add it to a an hourly alarm that goes off on your gm uh, your 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 shift manager's phones to go right you need to go and check that now yeah check your bathrooms make sure that your um, toilet paper's stocked up make sure that you've got nothing uh, knocking around on the floors uh, clean just dry around the sinks i think one of the worst things when you go into a a bathroom is having just like wet patches around the sinks and you'll yeah you just you lean on it and you're like oh 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 yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um never go in in flip flops uh, that's also a good a good tip um oh I, the things i've seen in the bathrooms of nightclubs i've cleaned uh, <laughs> i mean why did you put a pint glass down the toilet first I don't know. I don't get it. Yeah, I love what you said about not being afraid to do the work yourself and then building systems around not having to do it repeatedly. Um, I think this is a really vital part of being a good manager, uh, first leading by example and then building systems around it. Um, now, let's talk about the skill sets that you need to develop once you move past that GM role and into managing multiple sites because I imagine um, there are definitely some new skill sets involved and it's probably best to start to develop those along the way. So you definitely need to be au okay with the technology. You can probably get away with it up to GM level, but once you're looking at multiple venues in multiple locations, you are going to have to do stuff remotely. Um, so uh, definitely look at things like Dropbox. I think it's ten bucks a month or something for the for the for Teams version. Do that. Um, it's it's money well spent uh, because you won't be chasing around after things, um, and it means that you can kind of monitor stuff as well. If if you've got a system set up where your reports all go in at the end of your shift into the Dropbox, then your GM doesn't have to be on site or your multi-site operator doesn't have to be on site to be able to see what's going on with those. Um, so that's that's definitely uh, one thing that's worth doing. Um, make sure that uh, everyone knows who's responsible for what is a, a massive thing. So it's accountability, to be completely honest. Um, because if you're looking after um, 10 sites, like if I'm looking after 10 sites, um and i was uh, you know i got an inventory the next day i would email every site and say don't forget you've got this tomorrow get your invoices onto the system you know make sure that you've done the prep work so that you're not in the weeds for the whole day tomorrow um so there's that sort of thing and then i would i generally as well would ask the um the gms or whoever it is that's actually doing that inventory uh, the following day before they close it to give me a shout uh, and we'd look over the numbers together and if there's anything that sticks out massively then that that that's definitely one of those things that we would uh, we investigate before we closed it and made it really difficult to do anything with um, in terms of the other skill set stuff I mean presenting is actually quite useful when you get to this sort of stage because you you will certainly have GM's meetings like once a month at least uh, and you'll need to be able to articulate in front of those people um, one of the things that I've notice that just from podcasting has become uh, really useful is i don't say um as much as i used to uh i will think about things and i'll maybe just slow down what i'm saying while i work out what's next rather than rather than just going uh and so uh or i'll just pause for effect <laughs> 
yeah. So 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 that's that's something that's actually really useful. But yeah, get used to using technology. Make sure that you've got email set up on your phone because you don't always want to drive into the the venue just to just to grab your emails, and you will probably get into less trouble if you've not missed them. So, any other words of wisdom for um, for a new bartender that may be uh, looking down the road and thinking, "Huh, that sounds really interesting. I think I might start to pursue being a multi site operator." Just just do it, man. I love it. I I've I've been in this industry now what eighteen years nearly. So like fifty percent of my life. <laughs> Um, because obviously in the UK you can do it from eighteen, and um, yeah, so I I've I've loved it the whole way. I've loved the ride. I wouldn't have set up Bartender HQ if I wasn't super passionate about the industry. Um, but passion is the main thing. If you don't love it, find something else. Like you're gonna spend at least a third of your um of your life working, um probably more. So why do it if it's not something you love doing every day? It has to be something you love. If not, find something different. Because you love something. We all love something. But also be aware that once you get up to sort of GM and certainly the multi-site operator, you're not going to be talking to many guests. You know, it's it's not going to be a day-to-day thing. It's great when you can. And if you're if you're trialing cocktails, um, one of the best things that we did was actually walk around the, the venue. We had... Um, uh, the operations manager for the bodegas wanted to have the mojitos one way. I wanted to have them a different way. So he really liked having them with um, fresh lime squeezed in there uh, and muddled. And I preferred it with uh, the juice rather than the chunks of lime. Um, and so we took it round to 10 guests. And guess what? 10 of them liked it my way. Awkward. Um, so, sorry, Steve. <laughs> I don't think he listens, but if he does... Sorry, Steve. <laughs> so, uh, ten out of ten guests definitely approved yours. That's that's uh, pretty decisive, man. Sorry, Steve, you didn't have a you didn't have a chance on this one. Um, but now, when we move from general manager up to uh, multi site operator, what are some of the things that um, surprised you? Like, actually, at the at the beginning of the week, especially with with the role that I was in, I had to write a, a weekly plan of this is where I'm going to be and this is the days and this is the hours that I'm working and stuff like that. And when you're looking at that blank sheet of paper, like, you know what you need to achieve and you know, like, and obviously my wife was working at the same time. So we were having to plan around her, her shifts, uh, running a pub and stuff like that. So you're like, okay, where can I actually fit this in? And where's going to be the most effective, uh, you know, like, is it going to be more effective for me to be behind the bar coaching the bartenders? Or is it going to be more effective for me to be sitting at home going through spreadsheets? Or is it going to be more effective for me to do it in the daytime? Or do an evening when it's busier, but we won't be able to necessarily get as much... Do you know what I mean? So it's 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 balancing. Uh, it's priorita- Prioritizing is probably the biggest thing. And making sure that you do the most important things first. Like... Look at look at what the results are going to be from everything that you've got on your list, uh, and the one that's going to get you the biggest results you do first, regardless of whether it's something you enjoy doing or whether it's something that you absolutely despise. Um, you you just need to prioritize in in those terms and not not worry about. Um, yeah, nah, that doesn't sound like fun. So I'll uh, yeah, I'll go and throw some bottles around at the Vic tonight. You know, that's. That's that's the biggest one. Yeah, I can imagine that trying to manage your time when you have so many different properties that you have to kind of see um, on a day to day, week week to week basis um, could be a really significant challenge. Um, you know, technology is great, but that in person um, consultation or you know just getting eyes on a property is so so valuable. Um, I can imagine how difficult that must be. Um, but definitely appreciate your insight in, into that and everything that we've kind of covered on on this podcast. So you've given us some great advice all the way up to um, up to multi-site operators. So, um, so what's next, man? What's what's past that? What's the uh, the career path that takes you past multi-site operator? You you want to give me five minutes on what I do now? Yeah, yeah. If you have the time, that's sure. great. So, uh, so I came out of the multi-site thing um, just over six months ago, uh, and I worked uh, as one of these distributor reps. Um, so I was working uh, for a, a brand called Catalyst over here. Um, which is, as I say, part of this huge sort of um, conglomerate um, 
massive, massive turnover. The the company is doing 1.7 billion, I think, this year. Something ridiculous like that. So it's a huge thing. So we we have a brand agency, but we've also got wholesale that's part of what we do. We've also got retail. So we've got I think 400 uh, franchise retailers that are like um, liquor stores. Uh, we've got um, our own innovation department, so we're creating our own products now. Um, but I was out there, and I was one of the guys that was going out to bars um, to to kind of drum up the demand within the bartenders and and kind of support with events and that sort of thing, um, which was really really fun. Um, and that's again, yeah. So it's yeah, it's kind of a, a cross between sales and brand ambassador. Um, so you're you're going out building the demand, but then also um, get getting those sales and setting up the deals that we were talking about earlier with the retros and that sort of thing. Um, so I was doing that for six months, and then they decided um, that they didn't need our team anymore. Uh, so we were on the brink of being made redundant, and the majority of my team were. Uh, and I applied for a new role, which I uh, was successful in on Tuesday. Uh, I'd taken my company car back to the head office. Um, I'd got my laptop and I got my printer and everything packed up. I dismantled my house uh, and I was going down to the office for my last day uh, to, to take everything back, get my train home um, and uh, had my second interview for this role, which is spirits development manager for the group. Um, and I was successful. So I got a big pay rise and got to drive my car home again. <laughs> so, so it's, it's really exciting. And like the portfolio that we have is, is pretty special. Um, going from sort of Sousa and Larios and um, Sobieski Vodka and uh, a few others uh, that are kind of big names, like Mary Brizard, um, Liqueurs, and uh, let me have a quick look behind me, Pampero, um, J&B Rare Scotch, um, and then, so, so that's kind of our core range, and then we've got some really, really fun stuff, so um, uh, Eden Mill, um, gins which are made up uh, in St Andrews at the golf course in Scotland um, we've got uh, Burrito Fiestero which is a uh, mezcal um, which is made up in the Durango region it's my favourite product I think in the world um, because Burrito Fiestero means little party donkey um, and that's just the best uh, that's just the best name for a, a, a mezcal I think uh, we've also got a mezcal gin Yes, get excited, right? So, so they basically make a, a mezcal and then they infuse it uh, like a pechuga, um, where you'd have the the turkey and stuff in it, but it's essentially a, a vegan pechuga. Um, but they put in, yeah, absolutely. So they they put in the your standard kind of gin botanicals as well as avocado leaf and um, so sort of ancho chili and some stuff like that. So it's it's really fun, yeah. But yeah, we've got we've got this huge range, you know. We've got we've got um, uh, Prairie actually, which is an American um, organic gin, um, and they do a cucumber vodka and stuff like that. It tastes amazing. Man, that does sound good. Yeah, so so I'm kind of drinks uh, well spirits development manager for the group. So I kind of I've got to do range reviews and make sure we've we've got the right spirits in there. I think we need to get ourselves uh, an American whiskey. Um, so if uh, if anyone out there is looking after American whiskey that's not in the UK, come and talk to me. Because um, we're looking to bring one over. I'm not sure what yet. Um, but I think we've got a bit of a gap in our range. But yeah, I've got a lovely little rack of uh, some of my spirits there. Yeah, I've got some really good stuff. And uh, Bottega. I don't know if you guys have Bottega over there. It's Prosecco big in the US. Yeah, so it's, it's a chrome, um, kind of gold chrome bottle. Um, it's really good. It's DOCG liquid. Um, they're only allowed to put DOC on the bottle because uh, because it's not clear. So they're not allowed to put the the higher grade on it. But the liquid is astonishing. Uh, it's really really good. It's generally in travel uh, retail, so you'll see it if you if you're flying around the world quite a lot. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, um, so I've got a, a lot of stuff on my plate, but it's going to be really fun, really exciting. So yeah, that's a pretty exciting story. Uh... David Singwell, bartender, um, all the way up to spirit specialist in brand development. Um, it's quite a career you've had, and uh, can't 
wait to see what's next. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Um, I know you spent a lot of time on this podcast and definitely appreciate it. Um, now, if there anybody wants to reach out to you, um, what's going to be the best way? Yeah, just chuck at bartenderhq on there. Uh, you'll you'll get me um, on Twitter. Bartenderhq picks on Instagram because someone else, probably me, previously had already uh, registered Bartender HQ. I can't imagine anyone else is like poaching it. Like, ah, one day we'll make thousands of pence from this guy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think anyone's uh, squatting on that. <laughs> Thanks again for all your time, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to uh, to connect again soon. You're very welcome. Thank you, man. Cheers. <laughs> So thanks again to David Singwell from Bartender HQ uh, for his time and also sharing his experience as a multi-site operator. Um, we'll have some more interviews in the near future and uh, I hope the editing was uh, up to par and it didn't take away from, um, from the information that he wanted to share with us. Uh, so definitely stay tuned for more interviews now that we have the technology conquered and uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Cheers. <laughs> Never miss an episode by subscribing in iTunes or YouTube. And as always, check out the show notes by clicking on the right.